Today, I'll be talking about relaxation and time scales in disordered XX model with onside defacing, the work which I did when I was a postdoc with Marco in the University of Ljubljana, uh, who is also in the audience. This has to deal with Anderson localization, so I'm happy that I don't have to talk about my MBL after Anatoly. <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah. So let me try to first uh, motivate why this study is interesting, or rather why we felt it's interesting to study this particular model. So though this has been told many times in this conference, let me just recap the relevant points for my talk. So we know that disordered XX model in 1D uh, for thermodynamic limit, it has Anderson localization for any disorder strength. This is established. And typically localization is indicated by lack of transport in such systems, and that's why you call it an Anderson insulator. Now, the idea is if you, this is all true for isolated systems, but if you make the system no longer isolated, then what it do is typically it will break localization in some manner, but localization will still slow down the effects of, for example, if you're going to deface your system, it will slow down the defacing and so on. And this is what this talk is all about. So in this talk, I'll take an open system where I will discuss some decoherence effect specifically the defacing or Z-noise, which uh, Takashi also used in his talk uh, as an example. And uh, I will ask this following question. How much slowing down can you actually see in such a system for defacing? And how do the observables, or in my case, I will concentrate on one single observable, reach the steady state? I'm not concerned about the steady state because as we all know, it's trivial for Z-noise. It's just identity. But the idea is that this decoherence times are actually quite relevant to experiments as well, because uh, when you decohere, what you do is you go from a quantum state to a classically correlated state because you lose all information, it becomes identity. And so, and for quantum supremacy or whatever people call it, your state has to be quantum. And so you need to define time scales till which your state is quantum for uh, the thing. And that's why it's important to study this. And yeah, the quantity which we will concentrate on is actually experimentally relevant because it's made up of local operators. It's imbalance, which is just the difference between magnetization into successive sites summed over the whole lattice, a staggered magnetization. The thing is, we are not the first persons to actually study this particular thing. There are some other works, which is these, in some capacity have looked into this particular kind of system, but the thing, and what they have said is, all of them almost have said that this imbalance grows as a stretched exponential, which means that instead of an exponential, you have an alpha factor on top, which is less than one, which means it's slightly slower than exponential. But nobody seems to really agree over what this alpha should be. Every, some, people, some of them say it's 0.33, some of them 0.42, and some of them 0.5. Most of these works are numerical. There is some analytical idea about why it's 0.5, but that's all. And for me, and for us actually, 0.33 and 0.5 are two very different values, and one should really look into what's going on. It was very puzzling for us. It turns out the answer is pretty simple, which I will show you later, but while doing so, we unearthed a lot of interesting physics in this model, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So let me do some preliminary ideas, though. I could skip this slide, but just uh, for completeness, I want to show that Lindblad master equation has a lot of approximations inbuilt, which we assume when we just apply it. So what we want to do is we have this von Neumann equation for this entire system, which is system plus environment. And for, because it has a lot of degrees of freedom, we want to reduce it and just study what the system does. And for that, we want to go from here to here, this Lindblad equation, and do a series of approximations that is weak system environment coupling. Your initial state should be like decoupled. Your system and environment should be decoupled initially your environment should be in a thermal state, and of course the Markovian approximation. And then it turns out even these all are not enough actually, because if you do so, if you go to the second order perturbation theory, you get something called a red field equation. But it turns out it's a trace preserving map, but it's not a positive map. So you might get probabilities which are actually negative and you don't want that. So then what you do is you do a rotating wave approximation and go to a Schrodinger picture, and you finally end up with the Lindblad equation. To be completely clear, this is just one way of looking at Lindblad equation. There are other ways, but this is like a physical way of looking at what happens. And after this, I will just assume that this is the equation that describes my motion and forget about all approximations in it. Okay, so let's just 
the model uh, this is the disordered xx model it's just this xx model with disorder on site magnetic fields in z direction aj is disorder i'll choose the strength to be w and in most cases it's taken in from uniform distribution unless i mention what distribution i'm taking and the initial state i start with is a nil state though the results are not really dependent on the initial state it's just that the nil state has maximal imbalance so the window for which i can see all the effects would be the largest for this initial state for other states you will sometimes see some when some effects but not all of them because the window is small so this is the best state to look at to be honest okay and yes this is the lenblad equation and this is the non unitary term which uh, is the dephasing term and this is the unitary evolution and this is the liouvelian operator and for us what we choose dephasing is on site dephasing the sigma z noise and it kills off all of diagonal terms and makes your system classical eventually now what's the issue the issue is this particular lk is sigma zk so it's actually quadratic in fermionic operators if you do a jordan wigner transformation so naively you might think that this not naively it is this l dephasing is actually quadratic in fermionic operators so if this thing is quadratic then even though this is a free fermion model it doesn't really directly break up into one particle two particle sectors which is later determinants of just the one particle sector there's no direct way of doing so that is why most people that at least the ones which i showed you in the first slide they approach this problem of time evolution using dmrg the problem with dmrg is you have a finite time and finite system size till which you can trust your results but there are a, there is another technique which can circumvent this problem for certain correlation like two point correlation or some other correlation functions which i'm going to talk about in the later half of my talk but and we use that to actually go to very large times and very large system sizes to comprehensively show what actually happens in this particular system and this is what i'm going to show in the next slide yeah sure so because it's dense it's the noise so what happens if i can simulate my turn on time after that the helium produces noise Uh, it's nothing wrong with that picture, but uh, the thing is, this. Well, you can obviously do that. There's nothing wrong, but this kind of gave us the results we wanted, and nobody did that before. So, and that's why. I mean, the sizes we go to is ten to the four anyway here. So there also, it's going to be similar, right? I don't think the results would change in what you're suggesting. But then, sort of secretly, this is still not interacting. Secret, exactly, secretly, this is still not interacting, but. you cannot see it immediately so okay so what do we see so we see actually five time scales so let me just go through this slide which is shows the all the results without the technical details so on the left half i show you the well it's not that good anyway i show you the schematic diagram of what the different time scales are so there are five time because on the right slide i show you what numerical results are so we simulated till l equal 10000 and uh, this order averaged of course and this tau here is actually a rescale time which comes out from second order perturbation theory i'll come to that later so it's actually since w is 8 so w square this is like 1 by 8 so this is 300 so actually 2400 is actual time which we could simulate and you can go higher it's just that nothing else happens anymore so we didn't care um So yeah, so as evident from this figure, there are five windows, and so let me get to those windows one by one. So the first window is kind of ultra short time, not very interesting because what you're going to see is just your imbalance goes as one by minus t square. There's some p factor here. Our log imbalance goes off as t square. Now, what happens here physically is you start since you start from a nil state. If you look at your correlation matrix, your correlation matrix is actually dag initial correlation matrix. and then when you switch on your hamiltonian and your liouvelian then off diagonal correlations first start developing but then it realizes it has this dephasing term which will try to bring it again back to a diagonal kind of thing so what happens is this off diagonal correlations first develop in the system and then start decaying after reaching a maximum this is what happens in this initial time scale and there's a competition between gamma and w to define what, where this time scale actually ends and whoever wins basically defines this t0 by the time scale ends it's not that interesting it's fine what's more interesting is the time scales 2 and 3 which appears because you have a disorder 
So this is where basically the slowing down kind of thing appears because you don't see this two time scales in the clean systems. So this second time scale is actually this beta square root of t. This log i t is beta square root of t. Our imbalance is exponential beta square root of t, which will remind you of the stress exponential, which I talked about in the first. With now, as you can see, this alpha is 0.5. So you might naively think, OK, they were right. But that's not the case, because what it is is only valid for small tau. So this is actually a linear approximation of the stressed exponential. And that stressed exponential is not actually asymptotic, unlike what the previous authors claimed. Uh, so it's valid till an approximate time scale of 0.1. This is a numerical kind of approximation. There is no correct exact limit to say that, yes, it will stop at 0.1, because it can't be like that for such systems. But that is what it is. And the interesting thing is, no matter what distribution of disorder you choose, normal, exponential, uniform, you will see this time scale. You'll see this particular beta square root of t. But then what happens is things change after the small time scale. When you go beyond this linear approximation, and for different disorders, like different distribution of disorders, you actually start seeing different kind of behaviors, so non-generic behavior, depending on the choice of disorder distribution. And all of them are actually slightly different from this stressed exponential. So what previously what people did, since most of them did numerical simulation and then fitted the data, some of them ended here, some of them ended here, and different, they ended at different places. So the window of fit was different for different people, and so different people got different values. So this is the problem with DMRG. In, if you can do something beyond DMRG, that's better. And that's the, basically the thing. For some reason, people didn't do it before. But it turns out this is not the end of the story, because if you evolve it to more and more time, then the system realizes the localization basically breaks down. The system localization kind of was able to stop your def defacing to, from just making your system completely classical. But now it loses to defacing, basically. So T2 marks the end of the local relaxation in the system. And beyond that, you get a power law decay. So log IT is half log P. So for open boundary conditions, your decay is 1 by t to the half. And for periodic boundary conditions, your decay is 1 by t to the 3 by 2. This is actually quite interesting, because if you don't have disorder for clean systems and open boundary conditions, you exactly get 1 by t to the half. And there's an L factor, which I'm skipping for now, 1 by t to the half. That's good. But for periodic boundary conditions for clean systems, what you have is an exponential decay of imbalance. You actually have exponential minus 4 gamma t. Because for periodic boundary conditions, each of the K, you have these K modes, which are independent of each other, and each of them decay with the same kind of uh, due to the dephasing, and therefore you just get exponential for gamma t. But what disorder does, it's, now it becomes a relevant perturbation for this boundary condition. So it completely changes your asymptotic decay, and it makes it to a power law, which is 1 by t to the 3 by t. And this is typically, at least I have not seen it, this particular decay in literature in this kind of setting. The interesting thing is, since this is a local regime and this is a non-local regime, there is always a finite time before the system realizes what its boundary conditions are. So even for open boundary conditions, for times less than, let's say, L by 2 before the light cone hits the boundary, it's not exact. Of course, it's not ballistic, exactly. You still see t to the 3 by 2 kind of, 1 by t to the 3 by 2 kind of behavior. So I would say the correct asymptotic behavior in such system, when you have a thermodynamic limit of L tends to infinity, is actually 1 by t to the 3 by 2, which nobody ever really told before. And the good thing is we can also show this analytically, which if I have time, I will show you properly. And the thing is, on the right plot, we do our numerics, and, and we then fit, try to see our, how our analytical dashed line. These dashed lines are also analytical results of different effective models, how it works. And we find that it works pretty well. And the last kind of thing is due to, again, finite size, because in finite size, you always have a finite Liouvillean gap. And your system, this is basically like the Thule stand, to be honest, in such systems. And then uh, you have this uh, lambda 1 if the, is the last non-zero Liouvillean eigenvalue. And uh, that's what it decays with exponential lambda 1. And so yeah, this is basically the story. There are not one, but actually five time scales. If you look at it closely, you'll see and understand all the five. Uh, I will now go to the technical part of the talk, but I'm taking a breather. So if anyone has questions, they can ask. So now I'm going to discuss the method by which we did this analysis. Uh, I'm doing OK with the time. Seems OK. So as I told before, that there is a quartic nature 
of your Liouvillian, but it turns out there's a hierarchy of equation for observables because that's Anatoly Ponder. It's effectively like a free system, but it's, even if it looks like it's not. So the idea is since we require this imbalance only for our system, which is just a two point correlation function with quadratic and fermionic operators, it turns out that it results in a huge simplification because if you calculate the equation for motion of this two point correlation function independently, correctly, you will find that it only depends on other two point correlation functions, just like you see in your uh, non like let's say non-open and isolated system, it turns out that the higher point correlation functions is slightly different. They now depend on both two, like for example, the three point correlation functions depend on two and three point correlation functions and then four point and so on and so forth. And this is actually kind of an alternative way to see this. I mean, there is this third quantization by Tomash's group, which is pretty something idea is pretty similar. So the idea is that instead of four to the L equations, we just need to solve L square equations, which gives us a huge advantage. And this is how the equations look. So let's just go through the terms one by one. The C is just your correlation matrix. This is consists of all the two point fermionic observable expectations. And this is a diagonal, which is just this AJ. And the C tilde, which you see in this particular part of the equation is again, just C and the diagonal part removed. That's it. And P is just your Hamiltonian. That is just the hopping term and your disorder term, and gamma is your dephasing. And so now you have this, this stand-dependent equation. You can use your RK4 to solve as large systems as your computer can allow. And what we need is imbalance, and it turns out it's just the diagonal part of C multiplied by some prefactors because it's staggered. And that's it, basically. And I start from the initial state, which is the initial state. I solve it using standard RK4 methods till as much as you can be. And another way of looking at this equation is if you linearize C, then uh, you have kind of a linear equation where you have this Q matrix determining how your F will go towards a steady state. And it turns out that this is what one of the, one of the ways to understand all the different regimes by studying the properties of Q, which I will come in a couple of slides later. Okay. So let's start from region one. So region one, as I said, is most least interesting, but still you can see some interesting physics here. Um, so what is it, if you do a power series in T, then the, you'll see that the first non-zero term will look something like this. It's one minus eta T squared. And it turns out for clean systems, this eta factor is 16. Uh, this is 16 T squared. And this is the smallest time scale. But the interesting thing is that as you increase this order, you like, for example, this line, matches with this, this particular 16 less than the first one, then this one less than the second one. So this time scale for which it behaves as this particular thing decreases as you increase this order, which is consistent with what I told you before that T0 is proportional to one by W. Okay, now I have a cartoon here, which might run or might not run, I don't know. But the idea is that for clean systems, this is the, how the correlation matrix uh, looks at time T equal to zero. And uh, let me try to show how it evolves in time. So what happens is that first, again, you see there's some reddish regions around this, and then it starts to decay immediately. And it's all, everything is decaying very fast and so on and so forth. But if you look at the density matrix, now because you have a Neal state, so you have just one point on the density matrix, the correlation had this diagonal, while the density matrix initially was just at one point. So what you see is actually your density matrix becoming fully diagonal. This is what usually happens during evolution. So this is what I try, I'm trying to say here. So correlations will spread rapidly through the system, reach a maxima, and then you will start decaying at some kind of time scale like this. And since this is an ultra short time scale behavior, you can find very local models like two side models, and you can extract something like eight instead of 16. For 16, you need a bit more uh, sites, but for, just from a simple two side model, you can extract that your IT would behave like this. But now what happens when you add disorder? start from the same state, then as you can see, it's much slower. This entire thing happening is at a much slower and it's uh, taking much larger time to kind of de uh, decay to zero. And similarly for this density matrix. And it's, as you can see, since it's disordered, different kind of sites or regions uh, fill, it, uh, fill up at different times. It's not like 
everything fills up together correctly. So basically, when you have this disorder, you have a competition between your Hamiltonian term, which is this hopping from P, and your gamma. And depending on which term is dominating, that will give you this particular time scale in the initial time, which uh, till which you get this initial one minus eta t square. But okay, this is fine. This is not that interesting. But now let's go to region two and three, which is what most of the people are interested in. So for region two and three, how do you know it's a local? I said that evolution is local, but how can I show it? The way to show it is by taking a three site local model, which takes just your site and the two sites around it. And you create your effective evolution operator, let's put it this way. And if you can describe the physics by that evolution operator, then you're good. Then it's your system, you can show that your system is local. It turns out that's what we do. So we take this disorder much greater than gamma, and you take the influence of two neighboring sites. And of course, you ignore the CIJs, which are more than two sites apart, more than one side apart. So you ignore them. Then you have this linearized equation with this kind of variables. And then this Q matrix, which I call governs the evolution of the linearized equation. It can be written in a tractable form. You rearrange some indices and stuff, where this O is a null matrix. Every element is zero. And it's B, C, D are some other non-trivial matrices. And what you're trying to look at is even in this local evolution, you're looking at the large time scales of the local evolution. Because in the ultra short time scales, you already see what happens. And that also comes from this large eigenvalues here. But you want to see how the small eigenvalues behave in this local Liouvillian. And for that, you just do a second order degenerate perturbation theory in this zero sector. And you get three, obviously, this is a three cross stream. You see three values. One of them is zero. And the other two looks like this. But this small delta is just the difference between the disorder strengths of the two sides. So delta one is like j minus one minus j. And delta, delta two is just j and j plus one, the difference between two sides. And that's all. And it turns out you can also find the eigenvectors using this perturbation theory technique. And then if you, uh, if you plug everything together, you will see only one of the eigenvalues is actually relevant, not the both, because the other eigenvector has much smaller overlap with your operator, which is imbalanced than this. And it turns out that this is, you can describe the motion by, describe this, uh, uh, this evolution of thing by this kind of equation, where instead of like a complicated thing, if you give me a set of numbers on your diagonal, uh, I mean, give you a set of numbers on your sites, I can just compute this delta JT using this formula, and I will get this FT, which is this particular black line. I'm not sure if the colors are totally visible, but the best line here, which matches well with this uh, numerical data. And you're going to get that. So this is quite a versatile thing. You give me any set of disorder, and I will tell you how it looks like in this thing without going into the full numerics. And this is this order L process, so much simpler than before. It turns out, though, uh, you can do a bit more if you do a few more approximations. And uh, we want to get a functional form of this entire F. And the way to do so is then assume a few that these lambda 1 or lambda 2 are uncorrelated so that you can somehow take them out and make a few more approximations and convert this to an integral. And it turns out that for uniform disorder distribution, you get a function, which is clearly not exponential square root of t. Uh, and this function is basically somewhere here, this green line, this is LGT, which is closely followed by this uh, square root of 8 pi t, which comes up if you put small tau tends to zero, I mean, linear approximation of this thing. But the idea is this is for uniform disorder. For Gaussian disorder distribution, again, you can compute this FGT, which is this green line. But if you compute this approximate GT for this Gaussian disorder, you actually end up getting square root of 8 tau, which is an exact uh, like stress exponential with this alpha equal to half. And it turns out the paper which actually showed analytically that tau might be equal to half made this approximation. They made every disorder like a Gaussian disorder, and then they got the square root of 8 tau. And you can also play the same game with alternating disorder, exponential, or aubrey and you will get your results correctly. So this is all about region two and three. And now let's go to the late time. I have 10 minutes. Good. Late time region. Before going to region four, let us do region five, which is simpler than region four, because you just need to look at the, this particular root of the Liouvillian. As Takashi also talked about in his talk, so if you have this rho t evolution with this Liouvillian, 
and if lambda j are the roots of the Liouvillian, we just need to work with one particle sitter effectively because this Q matrix, which covers the evolution, is actually similar to this one particle sitter Liouvillian, meaning the eigenvalues are the same while the eigenvectors are rotated. So I'm going to use them both interchangeably. But anyway, the point is that the relevant eigenvalue is this one, which you need to look at to look at the late time evolution. And it turns out that that is the one, of course, and you can actually even analytically predict the lines of contour of how it will behave when you change gamma and W. And I'm not going to go into this, but there's an effective Heisenberg Hamiltonian developed by Marco and other, others way before this, where they found that the late time evolution is governed uh, by, the, by an effective Heisenberg model, and then by connecting some dots, by finding how you can compute the eigenvalues of this effective Heisenberg model, you can actually analytically predict these lines of contour completely. That's pretty interesting in its own way. But how do the power law come? The power law comes because it's not just this. You have to look at a set of eigenvalues with real uh, lambda j, not just the last one, but a set of them. And because in the thermodynamic limit, what happens is this gap actually closes and you get a continuum of eigenvalues. And what we need to identify is how that continuum behaves to figure out what power law it is. So, uh, so this is the result for region four. So what you see here is open boundary condition and periodic boundary condition. And this is just uh, reassuring you that it, indeed it is uh, half log T and it matches well with numerical results. And indeed this is three by two log T because this is log IT. So three by two log T matching well with numerical results. And the idea is that you can actually find this eigenvalues with the same effective Heisenberg model, just as I told you before, which was there in this paper. And you can predict that there is a prefactor A involved in all these kind of growths, again, analytically, which looks something like this, W is a disorder string. And what you need to do is you need to expand your imbalance around the non-equilibrium steady state value I in S. And you have this, which, and you have this eigenvalues of a Liouvillian. And what you have here is the overlap of the eigenvectors of the corresponding eigenvalues with the operator you're looking at. And this is actually the most important fact here, which usually people don't take, but it turns out this is what changes from OBC to PBC, and that's what changes your power law. So how does it happen? So here I plot uh, numerical, these dots are numerical data of averaged over many disorganizations of both OBC and PBC of how the lambda eigenvalues look. And it turns out beyond the degeneracy of PBC, you have this line which comes from this set of uh, A's where it matches very well with that. So this just goes as J square over L square, as, as you can see here. So you have a J square over L square here. But now comes the interesting thing. For open boundary conditions, if you have a clean system, no disorder, then this IJ is actually a constant over here. Its value is quite large. I think it was like 0.5 or something, I forgot but it's quite large. But for periodic boundary conditions, there is actually no overlap of IJ with this low-lying eigenvalues. It is zero. The only overlap which IJ has is with the eigenvalue four, which is why you get an exponential minus four gamma. T. But this changes with disorder, but for open boundary condition, the disorder is not still a strong enough perturbation to change these overlaps, which were already large. So that's why if you have an open boundary condition, you still see the same t to the half because this is a constant here. So you just do the integral, you'll get a t to the half. But now for periodic boundary condition, you had a zero initially, and now you're perturbing it, and that becomes then a relevant perturbation. And because that becomes a relevant perturbation, this part is numerical, but I'm sure you can probably show it analytically that this will be like j squared over L cube. Uh, this goes as j squared over L cube now. So this prefactor is now j squared over L cube. So because of this difference in prefactor, the integrals, of course, become different. And then this ultimately ends up showing a different kind of power law in these two cases. Okay. Um, I'm doing, seems to be doing very well with time. So I will just show this, what are the different cases? Uh, so what happens is that this alpha is just the power of this J and beta is this uh, power of this uh, imbalance operator overlapping with uh, the eigenvectors. So there are the different cases. So a periodic boundary condition, if you have even number of sites, and if you have no disorder, then since you, as I said, since you have no overlap, you just get an exponential 
uh, kind of behavior. But if you have odd L, then you have this one side which is left over, which turns, gives you some finite overlap, constant finite overlap, and therefore your beta still is zero. And you get something like this, which turns out to be the same thing for OBC for completely different reasons, because there, uh, and all this can be shown analytically by just using an effective uh, model. You can just compute the eigenvectors using the effective model. And then when you add disorder, this, of course, the factors change, but your, this does not change for open boundary conditions. But then if you have periodic boundary conditions, your factors change and your due to the three by two changes. So this is kind of the table of different cases which uh, we looked at. And uh, that brings us to the conclusion of my talk. So what we did was, was we studied imbalance with, for the disordered X exchange starting from a near initial state. But uh, the entire treatment which I showed here is generic in the sense that any disorder, any kind of such models can be treated like this. And what we found was uh, this five time scales and the stress exponential, which all the people have said before, is not generic. Clearly, it could not be because if different people are reporting different values, then all of them can't be true. So there was something going on and we found what is going on and we gave an analytical ex explanation of why all of those things happened. And what I would, I think, is to call the PVC behavior is a true asymptotic because if you take your length size to infinity, that is what will survive at maximum times. I mean, you can argue with me that no, it doesn't survive for t greater than l by two, but anyway, that's a different thing. And this is for me the totally new relaxation which people have not seen before at all. And you can play this game for other kinds of disorder. For example, quasi-periodic disorder, this Aubrey-Andre gives you some interesting results which are unpublished because. I never had time to properly analyze them. So it turns out that there, your long-term behavior is actually still exponential, but it's not the last eigenvalue which is relevant. There's some middle eigenvalue which is relevant. And you can also study how the range of your model affects it. The procedure is still the same. And what about interactions? Well, in, the thing is that with interactions, what I would say it has limited effect because this effective Heisenberg model, which I was talking about in the last part of my talk, is actually valid in presence of interactions. And it turns out that if your disorder is large enough, then whatever results you see here is still valid. And some of the authors of the papers I've shown before have claimed that at 3.7, they see some behavior change of uh, interaction, like W equal to 3.7 with interactions, something like that. They have seen, seen a behavior change from this uh, stressed exponential to a complete power law, but clearly 3.7 is just a number, and I don't believe that that should be the case, so this requires much more study. And you can also study non-local dephasing, as Marco Dan has done in one of his recent papers, and uh, this can be done with the same technique. So it's quite a versatile technique. Of course, there can be other ways to do it, but this is one of the ways you can study such systems and, and study asymptotics. And that thank you. And this is up in PRB, and I would love to take questions. Thank you. Questions? Have you looked at entanglement measures like negativity or anything like that? Problem with that is I don't really yet know how to convert it to uh, correlation functions directly yet like this. Because the entire idea was I time-evolved correlation functions by right? this equation. And if I go to entanglement, that's a problem. But what I know is with this uh, effective Heisenberg model approach, Marco and Tamash have studied, uh, wait, what was it again? Uh, purity, purity of the system. And there are some results for that. But one of my future aims is to understand how entanglement grows in this system. Let's see how it goes. Um, so when you were talking about this power law relaxation, um, as I understand it, and like we've, we've been actually looking at this paper pretty closely, um, you use the eigenvalues for the clean model. Is that correct? Like this J squared on L squared, like that's the clean result, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. So why is that legitimate when W is so large? Yes, let me just show you what I actually did. Thank you for asking this, because then I can show this slide. So there was actually three pieces to this entire idea. The first piece was this effective Heisenberg model, which works for unclean systems, which in fact is for unclean systems. 
And then we have this clean systems, which I know this effective eigen values are like this. But this works for both disordered systems. You can put this to zero and this still works. So I kind of matched this with the eigenvalues of the Heisenberg model and then added an extra factor in front effectively to get an effective kind of uh, new uh, eigenvalues. So it's like I combine the results of this by putting this to zero and see uh, which are the terms which is. It's kind of like slightly hand-waving, I would admit. But I first checked that, okay, what do I need to do to match this result with the Heisenberg result when I put this to zero? And then I come back to it and then I see, okay, now I don't put this to zero, but I keep all the other factors and then put it back. I don't think I really understand why that works. Like, like the, the, the low energy spectrum of the distorted Heisenberg model is different to the low Yes, but I'm spectrum. averaging over lots of disorders. That's why it works. So for a single disorder, it's not going to work. But if you average over them, you can assume that the average comes somewhere here. That's what the assumption which we did. Or which, are, yeah. So you, and then I get 2w squared by 3 here, which is what I used. So I'm saying that if you don't have this, you get a 2 pi squared j squared l squared gamma. And then if I add this, there is a new factor coming in front because of that average. OK, maybe we can talk more. Yeah, later. yeah, we can talk more about this. That you had it towards the end. Yes, yes. Yeah, so here, I mean, uh, so here you should show a power law decay one by square root t, right? But you also say uh, stressed exponential. Oh, so this is, so that is what I, my our work basically ad addressed. So people before said stress exponential and stopped, but we showed that stress exponential is actually a transient decay till a rescale time tau equal to one. Okay, and eventually. beyond that, this is what the actual decay is. So then eventually it's just diffusive spreading, right? Diffusive spread. But for people, actually, I would say that first it is t to the three by two for all this large systems. And then it goes for open boundary conditions. It's once the light cone hits the boundary, it becomes diffusive. And otherwise, it still stays as t to the three by two. And if you ask me why it's t to the three by two uh, faster than diffusive, I don't know. If that's the next question, that's something we couldn't figure out physically. Like it's given in the numerics and the. Uh, like Louvillian and stuff, but not physical yes. So when you say when you see one by t to the word three by two, is there uh, is there an earlier time where you see one by square root t also or the opposite actually? We see well, first you see yes one, uh, t to the three by two and then t, one by square root t. Okay. okay.